recording. Excellent. Well, I just want to say thank you all for being here. We're really excited that you're that you've decided to join us tonight. Um, and we are recording tonight so that um, people who are unable to join us can can actually see the presentation and for people to be able to go back and take a look again once they've been entranced by something that we saw tonight. Mm. So tonight's going to be a fun and relaxed kind of um, look at nine different presenters work or topics Pecha Kucha style. Um, we have now almost 850 members from all parts of the US Woo! and overseas. Woo! And with so many people that are joining the conversation, and we've got a lot of new people, um, even tonight, um, we thought we would take a minute to just remind ourselves and all of you that we are an open and transparent network of people who are all working in the field of public art in some way, and that we promote inclusivity and connection in everything that we do. Yes. PAX is an all volunteer organization and we rely on members to support this organization through donations of time and or funds, just like tonight. Everybody presenting and those supporting the presentations donated their time to make this event happen. Um, however, we, we deeply value that uh, artist time and we aspire to be able to pay artists eventually for their time creating content for public art exchange as we grow as an organization. But for now, costs are lean, and we can we um, subsist on um, uh, we can the cost uh, consist of paying for such platforms as Mighty Network, Zoom, etc., through donations from our members. If you could please consider contributing in the way that best fits for you, fits you, and then uh, let's just move on to the presentations. So we thank tonight's exciting list of presenters, and we're going to start tonight with uh, Lori Hepner. So Lori, if you would um, share your screen. Yeah, thanks. So hi, everybody. Um, random aside, I have a, a cat who might randomly decide to run over because he seems to be doing that right now. So we will see what happens. Um, all right, so I'm going to share my screen. And all right, so you shouldn't see anything just yet. Um, so like I said earlier, I'm artist Lori Hefner. I'm a visual artist and public artist working in Pittsburgh. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about a few projects that have happened over the last two years where I've been doing these community-centered collaborative uh, art making workshops through a part of that. So what you're seeing now is a piece that was up at the Bakery Square area of Pittsburgh. It's sort of where Google's offices are here in the east end of Pittsburgh. And the developer Walnut Capital put up this new building and put out a call for artists. And so I was one of the artists that was selected and they've actually now gone on to do their do on their fourth artist coming up um, where I was able to do this work with um, some residencies with students in local elementary schools and sort of creating these two figures, the Larimer Caryatids uh, for the Larimer neighborhood of Pittsburgh. And what was happening at the workshops is that I do this sort of real time light painting using different LED devices, some that I've built and kind of allows people to participate in the art making workshops without having to have any kind of skills or equipment. They just have to show up and sort of have the ability to, to want to do some things when we work on that. So let me show you the some examples of that. So these are some of the different uh, kids that I was working with on a few of these projects. So at the top of the screen, that's from about two years ago, kind of doing some light painting in the Hazelwood neighborhood of Pittsburgh. And down at the bottom left, these are some of the silhouettes that students at the Larimer Elementary School were doing. Lori, so I'm what, sorry to interrupt. This is Sue. Yeah. Um, we're not seeing your screen. Nobody's Seriously? seeing it. Oh, yeah. What's going on? Sorry. Somebody should have told me earlier than that. Sorry, I've had a very frustrating day of teaching. <laughs> um, I don't know why the screen share is paused. Let me find out why this isn't working. I'm gonna cancel this and do this again. Sorry, it's been a really, really long day for me. <laughs> and the technology, sorry, I didn't have the chat open because I was looking at my presentation and I didn't see any of you flagging me. This worked fine and perfectly in the test chat, I might add. Um, okay, so. 
Sorry about this. No, I worries. really shouldn't have been. No Can I have somebody else? Does the next person want to go as I figure out the technology since it's now not working? Um, I can go if you'd like. I'm, I'm, yes, I'm ready, and hopefully I don't that. have that. <laughs> yeah, yes, I'm so sorry, wonderful. Lori, Thank you. that happened to sure. you. We can move on to the next. Thanks. Hang on a second. I'm going to share my screen quickly. There we go. So Lauren, thanks. Thanks for being willing to step up and, and uh, jump in. So we're going to um, ask you to share your screen now. OK, so if I if I don't have anything on my screen, you all will tell me, right? I'll <laughs> right. tell you quicker this time. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I cannot um, share screen while the participant is sharing, it says. OK, let's try it now. Does it still think that I'm sharing? Uh, I don't know. It's we good. See you. We see a Lauren's screen. That sounds great. OK, I just want to move my fantastic. Uh, hi, <laughs> my name is Lauren Muni, and I'm an artisan working in the historical skill of silhouette portraiture. I'm one of only 20 people worldwide who still cut silhouettes freehand as they did 200 years ago with no drawing, tracing, or shadows. Each portrait takes an average of 90 seconds. Early American Life magazine has named me a master traditional artist 10 years in a row. And I'll be putting video of my cutting a silhouette into the chat, but in a few minutes. I feel like my work is all about public engagement, which I am now translating to public art. In 2022, the Maryland State Arts Council awarded me a grant to create a freeze of silhouettes in a public place, the Peel Center, which is Baltimore's community museum. My deepest desire for this project was to portrait all types of people, even those seldom represented. I called this project Your Face, Your Place in History, and nicknamed it the Peel Faces Project. Hundreds of community members from across Baltimore sat or stood for their own portrait. I visited uh, public markets, food halls, outdoor spaces, and galas. I even cut portraits over virtual appointments. The experience may not have, excuse me, the experience may have been the first time they have asked, they have sat for an artist made portrait. Each person received his, her, their own mounted silhouette to take home on a background which I hand printed with an 18th century style letterpress. Each person therefore feels like they are looking at themselves in Baltimore's past. For the museum installation, I cut black adhesive vinyl scans of the original silhouettes and secured them above the, trail, the tear rail. Each classic black silhouette celebrates the beauty of an individual. Each sitter is valued for their essence, not their skin color nor social class. Several of the people in the freeze are struggling or homeless. Several are wealthy and privileged. My silhouette freeze shows each person as an individual, yet together as a community. I completed the installation with the Peel Center's Accomplished Arts Apprentices of the Moses Williams Center. Moses Williams was a 19th century black silhouette artist who embodied freedom and artistry. The apprentices are learning skilled museum trades. Almost 300 silhouette faces surround the visitor in the entry and first room. The silhouettes can also speak. Visitors can scan several of them using a Smartify app to play audio stories recorded by the scissor, sitters. The Peel faces will live permanently on the walls as free public art. A second faces project took off in May 2022 during the production of the Peel faces project. My colleague Klaus Krupp, a museum director in Lorsch, Germany, was inspired by the Peel faces to commission a similar project. Lorsch is a small 1200 year old city near Frankfurt with world heritage sites and museums. We started calling the project Lorsch Faces. We wanted Lorsch Faces to build a sense of community between longtime residents and new immigrants and refugees. Some Lorsch families lived in the region for hundreds of years, but in the last several years, more refugees have arrived, including from Ukraine. Different cultures living together feel better when they're connected. A lottery system chose the most variety of faces, age, sexes, and backgrounds for the project. The translation of the German logo is 100 Lorsch profiles. We show Lorsch in its full diversity and also its unity. 
To underscore the unity, I designed a silhouette of the city's most famous landmark. Our project whispered its message, its message into the residents' hearts. I cut 100 silhouettes over a single weekend. People were thrilled to have their silhouettes portraits cut, as well as have a guest artist who came from the United States. Each face featured only the first name and the age. The silhouettes of the refugees blended into the portraits of the other residents. Interestingly, um, the silhouette's charm was not the ethnicity of the faces, but was a deconstruction of age. Age 62 looked as vibrant as age 32. This experiment against ethnic prejudice ended up as transformed into an experiment against ageism. The plan was to create an exhibition in the town hall or another public building, which hasn't yet occurred. Yet a Lorish Faces book was published in time to be sold for Christmas 2022. Proceeds from the book were donated to a local food pantry. The Lorish Faces books spread into families across Germany, while the original Lorish Faces silhouettes live in private houses across their own city. So to sum up, community engagement is as valuable as the final outcome of a larger artwork. My historical style silhouettes connect each person to the past. The person becomes a piece of art without time, without age, without borders, and without complicated explanation. I know the por power of community portraits, and I look forward to new projects with communities all over the world. Thank you. Oh, and let me put the links that I was telling you about into the chat. Here you go. Thank you, Lauren. That was great. Um, I'm going to check in with Lori. Lori, are you willing to go? Are you ready? Or would you like to wait? Um, I can I can go. I think it will work this time. I unplugged the monitor that I think was the problem. Okay. Awesome. Well, I'm going to stop sharing and let you go. Okay. Okay, so I'm artist Lori Hefner. Uh, I'm an artist based out of Pittsburgh, and I'm showing you some projects tonight that have to do with um, some community engaged public art projects. And these are all over the last two years. And so this is a piece, Larimer Caryatids, that uh, was installed for six months in the Bakery Square area of the east end of Pittsburgh. And Walnut Capital, who's the development group that runs this sort of office space, um, commissioned artists to work with two local elementary schools in art making workshops to kind of help create the public art. So this piece was one that I was doing workshops with the local students. And as a part of those, we were doing these light painting silhouettes. And as a part of that, sort of using lights in real time projection technology that I have, the students were able to sort of draw with these lights in real time. And one of the things that they really enjoyed is Sort of being able to play around with this six foot tall light stick that I have. Uh, in this case, we were using just sort of basic colors, but in often other parts of my projects and works, it's able to sort of real time paint photographs that are often photographs that I take myself. So with this piece, you can kind of see there's some workshop students in the lower left, and those were taken of the video stills from this real time light painting system. And so as a part of the project, this generates video. So I am gonna show some videos. I do have links that I will share in the chat after this. And so this is one of the, the videos that was sort of created that's a 42 minute loop that was projected into one of the window banks in the windows just adjacent to those facade murals that you saw. And so it was really important to me to be able to have every student that participated be able to see themselves in the artwork. So you can kind of see here, there are some students that were doing some drawing with flashlights and kind of being able to do the silhouette portraits at the same time. So throughout this kind of uh, 40 minute loop, there are these, the other silhouette figures that you see of, that were taken from different points in this. And so it was really great to be able to, I was once standing outside sort of meeting a friend while this was installed. And I had a woman come up to me and wanted to talk about the artwork. And she had no idea that I was the artist. She just wanted to talk about that. She thought it was so great that these kids were able to 
how to help create this technological art as a part of the project. So to share a little bit more about that, this is a portrait of me. And this was through a public art project that I did in Wailuku, Hawaii in fall 2022, which I'm not gonna talk about. But the photo here is mainly the UC. I have some wearable electronics that I've built as a part of this project. And so these wearable LEDs are programmable and allow me to put in images and text. And I created them so that they are kind of modular. And so it allows me to use them for different public art projects when I'm trying to get in touch with communities that maybe have low grip strength, such as senior citizens or people that might have mobility differences. So this is a little super sneak preview of a piece that's going in the UPMC Mercy Pavilion hospital building that's now being, bu being built. And Renee Pychocki is the public art manager that's running this project. And there are nine different artists doing different pieces in the building. And so I was doing these public art workshops over the summer where I was doing them at Mercy Hospital, as well as uh, in downtown Pittsburgh for the Pittsburgh Disability Pride inaugural event. And as newly outing myself as a neurodiverse artist, it was really important to me to be able to make work that was accessible to everyone. And so the wearable LEDs were able to kind of be put on with people that have mobility differences, either on their limbs or on some of their mobile, like in their wheelchair users on the wheelchairs and allowed their movement to kind of help create and draw these pieces. So with the participation of the different uh, individuals that did this, I was able to create this um, video piece that's gonna be available on site via a QR code. So I can, I'm kind of secretly sharing this. The project opens April 20th and there's two permanent pieces of mine that are gonna be on the wall in the Uptown Cafe area of the building, which is the only publicly accessible um, food venue in the entire hospital building. So it'll be people that are able to sit there and kind of you know, enjoy watching a video on their device maybe while they're eating lunch. And basically, I can't show you the two pieces that are going on the wall because they've not been unveiled yet. So I can share a little bit of the video from that process, but this is one that's not the piece that's going up on the wall, but kind of another um, result of that process. So it's been a really great experience being able to sort of see how different people kind of create with movement and are able to uh, participate in the public art process. And I will end there. So thank you. Fantastic, thank you. It's great. All right, back to sharing my screen. Oh, I lost my screen share bar. There it is. All right, next up is Michael and Daniela Kirby uh, from Maryland, Baltimore, Maryland. Thank you to uh, Ryan for all the all the help getting the Baltimore folks to come out. Um, I'm going to turn it over to you. I'm turning it over to you, Michael and Danielle. I'm going to stop share right now. Okay, thank you. Okay. Is that it? Yeah. Yep. Uh, is it working? We're not seeing you, your presentation yet. There we go. All set. Yeah. Uh, hi. Cool. Yeah, what's going on there? Yeah. Sorry. Hi. Uh, I am. I am uh, Michael Kirby. My dad. And this is Daniela Kirby. His daughter. And we are yeah. girls of Baltimore. Uh, so we did the. We recently we're going to be showing you some uh, recent work we've been doing over the past year. Uh, the first piece that you see is a chalk drawing we did in Baltimore uh, about the invasion of Ukraine, and we did this about uh, a year ago, two weeks after the invasion. Uh, it's made with soft pastels directly on the pavement, and yes, it does wash away with the rain. Uh, it took us about five days to complete, and we had many, many, many interactions. Um, there's a big uh, Ukrainian population in Baltimore, and yeah, very, very touching piece. Yeah. Uh, um, well, uh, yeah, um, we got to interact with a lot of different people, and uh, many people took pictures, and uh, they came up and told stories. Uh, their own homes and it was very touching and um yeah yeah and then so after this oh it's not going uh after completing that piece we did another one in washington dc 
Uh, the pavement was a lot rougher. So if you saw the previous picture, there was a lot more detail. So we had to sort of burn our fingers off when we did this one. Yeah, I got many blisters from this. Yeah, yeah, it was rough. Um, and we did some other pieces. Uh, this is another piece we did back in Baltimore. Um, again, it's just directly soft pastels on top of the pavement. Uh, what do you want to say about this one? Um, well, obviously this one was a lot easier to do because of the pavement. And um, we also did a little bit of tweaking from the previous uh, drawing that we did. Um, we also used a friend of ours as a model for the um, girl in the picture. And um, we do a lot of our own research um, to the Ukrainian um, people. In fact, the doll or the flowers behind it is supposed to be a Ukrainian doll. And then there's the um, Ukrainian like symbol of the trident that the girl is on. And yeah. Uh, the next couple of pieces we're gonna show you um, is a recent mural. Uh, it's mostly me working on this one because she's not old enough to go up on scaffolding or lifts yet, uh, but I'm sure she'll be there soon enough. Yes. Uh, so with my work, I've been, uh, I paint murals as you can tell, and um, versus painting directly on the wall, I build off the wall. Um, I'm one of like maybe a handful of artists that actually know how to paint frescoes. That's sort of like the Sistine ceiling sort of stuff. So I either build, put paneling on the wall and build off the wall. For example, this is the first shot of the wall where we put paneling up so that we could run electricity uh, and put lights up on the wall to illuminate it at night. Uh, and then after that, above the wall, the paneling, I stucco the surface to create these silhouettes of giant children, sort of like King Kong invasion of Baltimore, but they're giant children. Uh, again, the, the panels and the stucco kind of makes the artwork pop a lot more versus other methods and also makes it last a lot longer. So this should be around for our grandchildren and so on. Uh, and then as you get painted more after the stuccoing is all done, then we uh, fill it in with paint and make it all look really nice and pretty. And then we moved on. And this is the most recent shot from a couple of days ago. I'm still working on it right now, but uh, the idea is that uh, it's a bunch of children and they're sort of dominating the scene and creating, uh, playing in a dollhouse. And in the dollhouse are adults and they're interacting with the adults. And um, yeah, sort of just sort of like they're taking the lead versus the adults leading them. And it's a lot of like a, a 3D, what they call 3D or force perspective, anamorphic perspective. Uh, this is something I started many, many decades ago when I used to live over in Europe. And uh, yeah, and that's it. That's all we got to share. And you have anything else to add? Uh, no, not really. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you for having us. And uh, that's it. Thank you so much. That was excellent. Appreciate it. Next, we're going to have um, a presentation by Ryan Patterson, also of uh, Baltimore, and who uh, created the amazing graphic that you saw at the top of the slideshow tonight. Um, he's been doing wonderful things with PAX for quite a while, and we're really excited to see a presentation by him tonight. I'm going to turn it right over to you. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, everybody. It's fun to be on the presenting side and not just the volunteer organizer side. So thanks for having me bring this up here. Everybody see this OK? Good. All right. So um, yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Ryan Patterson, and I'm the Public Art Project Manager at the Maryland State Arts Council. And I've been there just about three years. And about three years ago, I had the pleasure of helping to start a conservation grant program. And so I just wanted to go over a couple of like lessons learned and um, observations from my time. I think this is kind of like the tip of the iceberg on hoping to develop these ideas and share them with other people. So just a um, quick overview of the facts. So uh, the conservation grant is similar to our public art new project grant, 
we offer $10,000 grants for planning and up to $50,000 grants for projects. We are pretty generous in that we don't require a match and um, all sorts of agencies can apply to it. Our new artworks grants allow individual artists to apply, but the conservation grant, we really wanna make sure that there's stakeholders and local community representatives that are kind of leading the charge. So um, we ask artists if they want to advocate for their own piece to partner with a local stakeholder. And we do require that the, the application is fairly simple. We require a conservator be involved and that the, um, there's some kind of a community need or priority demonstrated in the narrative, the, uh, narrative of the application. So um, I'm just going to share some nice photos and big ideas that I think could be developed a lot further. But number one is to always start with a good conservator. Um, you know, just the way a good recipe relies on great ingredients, the success of your conservation project hinges greatly on having a really thoughtful, patient, and um, knowledgeable conservator to rely on. Um, conservators, you know, they are trained to re review environmental conditions and know the chemical composition of materials. They can see beyond the surface, both physically and socially. So a lot of times an artist might remember one thing, a community might remember another thing, the owner might have a certain desire, and hopefully the conservator working with an administrator and all those different people I just listed can navigate some of that. Um, a conservator can be a great advocate for an artist, it can be a great advocate for a community. Uh, and recently we had a project where the community had at one point in the 90s toned a project down to a more muted historically accurate or historic color palette, and the conservators were able to bring it back to its full um, vibrancy uh, by relying on the artist and their um, records. Um, they're also the front face of your project. So just like having a really um, wonderful collaborative artist can really change the dynamic of working with an artist on a public project, a conservator who knows what they're talking about and presents themselves well uh, can go really far when the community shows up and asks questions about what's going on and what's, what's being done. And it really can be um, a tool to to, towards success. Two, artists are their best archivists, are the best archivists and advocates for their work. So here we see Pat Alexander showing my friend Molly uh, photos of the work she created back in the 80s for the Baltimore Metro system. You know, when you ask an artist, you know, um, how they created a piece, it's not going to be like a one sentence description that's included on the plaque. They're going to have all the stories about the administrators that came before you, the different people that they may have worked with along the way, fabricators you weren't aware of, or challenges that all can inform the conservation process. So it's one thing to know the chemical composition of a piece. It's a totally different game to know why a piece was made, what came before it, how it fits into the artist catalog, and it turns you into the biggest fan possible. I have found that there's no better way to get people engaged in loving any piece of public art than hearing about it from the person who made it. Um, that is just worth a ton. Despite all of this, money cannot solve what I've begun, begun calling a wicked problem. So um, a wicked problem is this, this term, I think it's using like management and, and things like that. And it's defined as a social or cultural problem that's difficult or impossible to solve because of its complex interconnected nature. They lack clarity in their aims and their solutions. All I'm saying is why do people keep tearing down art? Um, despite having money, despite having resources, uh, we will still continually see efforts like this. This picture on the right was taken just weeks ago where someone may say, um, um, it's too expensive to rehab this building or it's too outdated or um, it was faded and we can just paint a new one on the new building. Um, res resources can be provided, but um, you need an advocate in the community. So that brings us to the longer term. Um, projects take a community uh, that's not just people who live around it, but people who care about it, believe the importance of a piece, and believe um, that it's worth putting time and effort into figuring out the best way to conserve something. It takes patience and persistence. This is Linda De Palma's Redwood Arch, originally installed in the early 80s. For years, I heard um, business improvement district type folks um, or transportation officials talk about how it may be easier to tear this piece out than re- um, paint it. Um, it would be too costly or too difficult to close this small road down. 
um, after years and um, even 18 months after receiving the grant, um, the piece is finally complete. We're hoping to celebrate the ribbon cutting of this in the spring. Um, but Linda has been an advocate for this piece all the way along. And she gathered a network of other artists, administrators, and um, developers that she'd meet and convince through talking to them that it was worthwhile. And then the advocacy of all those groups working together has brought this piece back to life. And the finally, um, con conservation can be generative. Um, so our grant program actually allows you to pay for the relocation of an artwork. So um, an artwork does not have to be made by a Maryland artist as long as it's being moved or relocated within Maryland. In this case, a smaller town on the Eastern Shore, Chestertown, um, did not have a percent for art program, but it did have some nearby, um, a really fortunate thing that there was a nearby couple who were um, wealthy and they traveled and they collected sculpture. So their private collection is now being donated to the city in a very organized way, um, rather than a gift that a city doesn't want to accept. This is a planned process where the city is growing an arts collection across its small kind of um, downtown district and, and doing placemaking by relocating and actually conserving the sculptures from this couple's private collection. Um, the couple was very proud of it and they felt connected to the town. Uh, and if they would not have been accepted in as gifts, um, who knows what could have happened to the collection. So it's just a really great story about art building and creative placemaking through conservation funding and efforts. I kind of rushed through that, but um, I am incredibly proud of this work and I want to keep developing it further. Um, it takes a huge network of people who know what they're talking about and advocating for these conservation projects to happen. And we continue to uh, grow experience and knowledge. I also question sometimes whether grants are the right way to do this. I think it puts the um, community who wants to see a work conserved in the driver's seat, but it also eliminates the, um, or it requires a huge amount of um, knowledge and privilege to be able to find the time to go after a grant like this. Um, this wonderful project, uh, Art Benson's Nut and Bolt at Mount Royal Elementary School, um, was recently completed, but it was probably about seven years of people asking and looking for resources to make it happen. Meanwhile, there's other projects um, at nearby schools not being touched because they don't have the same kind of PTO structure. So um, how this gets to more equitable place, I'm not sure, but I think that these projects can serve as a um, great demonstration of the value of um, conservation in our communities. Thank you. Wow, uh, thank you, Ryan. That was that was great. Um, I'll, I have questions for you. We could talk later. <laughs> um, we've got next. We've got. Um, the fabulous George Berlin and Michelle Winchell. We're gonna let them take it away. I'm gonna stop sharing and give it, hang it, hand it over to you guys. Excellent, that was an awesome, awesome presentation, Ryan. Yeah. Uh, let me just click Thanks. some buttons here. All right, you should be seeing a big, beautiful screen, correct? Yes, people, we see it? Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Michelle, Michelle, it's all you. All right. Um, I'm Michelle Winchell. I work for the Downtown Partnership of Colorado Springs, and I'm the manager of our creative district um, and also our annual public art program. And I'm George Berlin. I'm projection designer for this immersive experience at the heart of Adam Man Alley. Uh, and Michelle and I actually met because of a posting on PAX where they were inviting submissions for this project and we won the open call. So uh, I think the next person is you. Yeah, so I'm gonna give a brief overview of the project as a whole and then George will share some details about his projection design. So Adam and Alley is a new creative placemaking project in downtown Colorado Springs, celebrating a local mountaineering club's unique role in our region's history. So since 1922, the club has climbed to the top of Pikes Peak on New Year's Eve each year and launched a fireworks display from the summit. Um, they started doing this in 1922 because they thought all of the New Year's Eve parties in Colorado Springs were boring and this sounded like more fun. Uh, Pikes Peak is a place of special significance for our region from our area's earliest indigenous inhabitants to today's residents, visitors and our outdoor adventurers from around the world. 
The art installations throughout the alley pay tribute to both the club's history and our community's relationship with mountaineering and the natural world. Um, some of the additional project elements use a visual language that will be familiar to outdoor enthusiasts of all kinds, um, lettering and sign colors that evoke vintage National Park Service trail signs, uh, blue diamond trailblaze markers, and even a map of the trail going up Pikes Peak in the alley pavement itself. Um, so I'm going to leave it on this slide for a moment and talk about this map on the bottom of the screen. If you start on the right side, you'll see the trailhead uh, that follows the path up to the Pikes Peak and travels to the left towards the summit. Uh, and you'll see different types of trees and animals listed, uh, scrub oak and squirrel and elk and other things. So we used that uh, progression up the mountain and the animals and plants you'll see to inform our design for the projection. So let's let's talk about that. Um, so we start here on the left side with the mural by El Mac, which is actually painted on the wall. Uh, that little tiny person there is me, so it gives you a sense of the scale. Um, and then you look on the upper right and you'll see a little taste of what we created to enhance the mural and tell more of the story. Our narrative starts with uh, the wonder and imagination, I'm sorry, the wonder of imagination, and then travels up Pikes Peak uh, much as the story as it progresses, so you'll see them uh, showcasing the magic of the trees and wildflowers and animals that hikers uh, like Michelle would enjoy along the way. Um, our creative brief from Michelle and the Adamant Club was the wonder of fireworks and the magic of enjoying nature. So we, uh, you can see along the bottom how we took the uh, the wildflowers and animals and and transformed them into like mythical glowing icons of the mountain full of light and energy. Um, I'm going to show you a video of this because uh, it's if you don't see it, you really don't understand what this is. Uh, but so take note of um, also how we use light and dark to reveal the art of the boy's face with our projection design. Um, so let me head to the next page here. Uh, so this is only about a minute long. The whole thing is, is uh, a little over 15 minutes, which I'm not going to show you all of. But uh, let's take a look. Michelle is going to talk about how some of this came together. Yes, I get to talk about the fun, pragmatic thing. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the projection is running nightly um, on our kind of earlier slide that had some of the other project elements. In addition to the projection, we have an LED mesh uh, screen that's installed at the alley entrance. And we actually ran a separate power supply for both of those things. And our DDA owns the installations and pays for maintenance and pays that monthly power bill. Um, and that was part of our project budget. So we did um, some early projections to see, get an estimate about <laughs> what the electric bill would be every month. And that helped make some of the decisions in the project. Um, and this was a huge partnership. So we did a lot of infrastructure work in the alley as a, in addition to the public art elements. So it was a partnership with the city, our um, city utilities, and then the Adaman Club in celebration of their 100th anniversary did the bulk of the fundraising that supported the, the public art installations. Um, we have great relationships with the downtown businesses that the downtown partnership. So we were able to secure property owner permission and buy-in 
kind of way in advance of actually convening the project planning group and getting all the plans in place. Uh, so you can go to this uh, fabulous address here, which I think uh, Sue is going to put into the chat for us. Uh, if you want to see more about the project, it's my website, which also has a link at the bottom to uh, Michelle's downtown Colorado Springs site, or you can contact us at those addresses. And if you have any questions, we're happy to answer them right now. And that's it. There is a question in the chat. James asked um, if the portrait of the boy has been on the wall for some time, and then you were commissioned to add the projections. Is that correct? Uh, let's see. Well, uh, do you want to start with this, Michelle? <laughs> yeah, so the, that mural was, was part of the project. Um, so it was painted first. We kind of, we worked in the muralist with the construction schedule. <laughs> so sort of when is it easiest to get a lift in? Um, and just due to some timing, I actually came in, I started in my role a little over a year ago. And so some of the initial project planning had already been done. And this, the muralist had kind of had a draft design that he'd been sitting on for over six months by the time we brought George in. Um, and we really appreciated George helping <laughs> work through some de design adjustments that were necessary to make the projection realistic because an earlier draft of that design had almost a solid black background and there are some layout adjustments. And um, so we really had a, we had a collaborative effort to get all those pieces to line up. Uh, yeah, I will, I will say if, if you're going to do a, a projection design with a mural, uh, have the, the mural artist and the projection artist work together. <laughs> so it's a very, very specific medium. And uh, you want those two to really feel married to each other and how they work. Fantastic. Thank you, guys. Um, I'm going to start sharing my screen and um, we'll see what uh, our next presenter has to share with us. Let me stop that. There we go. Awesome. James Martin with a public art administrator with Kansas City, Missouri. And we're going to get a sneak peek of a whole bunch of public art that's going to be um, uh, revealed to the public later this month. So James, I'm going to I'm going to turn this all over to you and you can tell us all the exciting details. Sure, yeah, thanks very much and, and grateful to be here. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, so the new terminal and parking garage do not open to the public until next Tuesday. So you are getting a sneak preview. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen here. And I just need to find it now. Here it is. Okay, so this is we're looking at the addition, or excuse me, the entirely new single terminal and parking garage, uh, the H shaped building uh, for the terminal, and then this is the parking garage here, and then just beyond it, you can see this uh, semicircular uh, terminal B that was the old design of the airport that opened in uh, 1972 and it outlived its life. So this uh, new single terminal and garage is a $1.5 billion project. The art budget for uh, the program was 5.65 million. And with that uh, amount, we were able to commission 28 different artists. Um, it was, uh, you know, kind of a, very definitely a community driven process. Uh, we had a consultant on board early on uh, to work with five project advisory artists to determine where works of art should go in the new terminal and garage and how much of the budget should be allocated for each of the spots. So we needed that, um, that consultant, Community Arts International was very valuable early on. And then the five project advisory artists who were, it was an open call for people to submit their qualifications here in Kansas City. So, uh, so here are some of the results. Uh, this is, um, it's called The Air Up There, and it's by Nick Cave. Um, some of you might know his uh, wind spinner forests, as he calls them, and, and that's what he proposed and what was selected for here in Kansas City. Um, this work has about 3,000 wind spinners, and it's nearly 700 feet long. 
and it's unbelievable the scale. Um, the budget that was allocated to that spot was nine hundred and seventy-five thousand um, dollars. It was a multi-tiered process uh, for doing the calls for artists. Um, so we had uh, nine different calls for artists with um, um, nine different locations. And uh, we determined early on with the uh, input of the project advisory artists that we wanted to have a different selection panel for each one of those locations. And the reason we wanted to do that was try to, to, try to um, foster diversity, equity, and inclusion with uh, the artwork that would be selected. Uh, so here's a different, slightly different view of uh, Nick Cave's The Air up there. And here's a cross, good cross-section of the artist community. Um, these are the folks that were able to come to the gala preview uh, last week. Um, most of them in this photograph are local artists. Um, this is work by Leo Villarreal it's called uh, Fountain KCI, and it is located where the A concourse meets up with the connector that uh, goes across to the B concourse. And uh, it was commissioned because we knew we wanted a um, fountain in this location based on public feedback, uh, but of course couldn't have real water. And so he won the commission for this imagined fountain. Here's an example of work by one of the local artists, um, Haas Nassal. We had 19 spaces set aside for local artists in the concourses. Uh, Hasna is an architect, uh, works in the public art world, and uh, she used the scraffito technique for these. Here's one of the other Kansas City-based artists. This is Kati Toivinen in a fun work called I Spy Carry On. Uh, she uses photo-based processes, um, uh, photogram-like processes. In, but in a computer and lots of layers and it's quite uh, technologically based. And here's the work by Sue Sunny Park on the way out uh, you know, to the baggage claim down below. Uh, it's called Molten Swing. And uh, that is a play off of a jazz composition by Benny Moten, famous work called Moten Swing. Uh, and Benny Moten was someone that was um, big in the important in the Kansas City jazz world. And here you can see it from more of an eye level view over the uh, shoulder of our uh, deputy De director of aviation there. So uh, I welcome any questions or comments. Fantastic, James, thank you. I don't see any questions in the chat right now. Um, maybe, uh, can we get an invite for uh, the 28th to come and see the work. If you, if you have a ticket flying to Kansas City, you're in good shape. Oh, man. I don't know that I have one. Shoot. Um, anyway, thank you so much. Really appreciate that. My pleasure. And if you'll stop sharing, we'll move on to our next presenter, um, Delia Dver. And I'm hoping I'm pronouncing your last name right. Delia, when we practiced, I didn't ask you how to pronounce your name, unfortunately. Um, but please, please um, kick off your presentation and also let us know how to pronounce your last name appropriately. Yeah. That Thanks. was great. No, Delia or Delia Dever is great. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Can you all see my first slide with the fiber art piece? Not yet, Delia. Oh, I think, I think I hit share. Let's see. Let's see, where's the share? Let me go back to Zoom. Typically at the very bottom center, it's the green button. There we go. Okay, last time it was up above. Okay, so I want to share. And, oh, where did it go? Here it is. Oh, it. I had it all ready to go. Are you seeing my monitor now? <laughs> yes, we are. We're seeing your desktop, yes. Okay. Um, let's see. I had it all ready to go. Let's see. Um, 
Let's see. Well, um, where is it? Billy, would you rather we go on to the next person until you're yeah, ready? Yeah, that would be great. Let's Sorry go about ahead that. And do that. Yeah, go ahead and stop sharing and we'll go on to the next person. Thank you. Got it. So I'm going to introduce our next presenter, Hannah Maximova um, out of Glendale, uh, California, artist. And um, we're going to stop sharing and let you go ahead and share your screen. Hannah, thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm going to share my screen. Um, is that showing up for everybody? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. So my name is Hannah Maximova. I'm a stained glass public artist. Um, I'm in Los Angeles area. And I'm starting with this piece. Um, that's about three feet long. It's I have done 18 large format murals, but I'm starting with this just to show you a little sense of um, how I use glass. So mosaic, as I'm sure most of you know, is a um, terrifically low maintenance and long lasting process indoors and out. And this piece is for a Cape Cod residence. And you can see that I used a little bit of fused glass, melted glass in a kiln on the, the lens of the lighthouse in the top right. And that's much thicker than the rest of the stained glass. So it really captures and refracts the light in interesting ways. And I use a lot of stain, I, a lot of fused glass in my work. On the lower left, you can see I have a couple, can you see my cursor? I have some secret dolphins that are the same color as the surrounding. <laughs> Glass. I like to hide things. You can hide all kinds of imagery in mosaic. That um, it's just a little extra fun thing for people to see. Um, okay, this is a piece called the Death of the Duke of a Duke Magian Day. This is at um, City of Glendale's Duke Magian Park, and it's about 26 feet long and six feet high at its highest point. And meeting with the the, the neighbors, the residents, and the decision makers, they just really wanted people to sort of participate in what is what is there to love about this park. This park covers over 700 acres of unspoiled wilderness, and there's an incredible diversity of animals there. So we tried to convey a day here. So on the left is the morning, on the right is the evening. You can see that the sky gets darker. Um, toward the right, and the animals are roughly pictured at the time of day that you're likely to see them. So you see it's bats and snakes and things on the right, and um, the shy mountain lion on the left. The tree on the left is the manzanita, which in my research I found out the Duke Magian Park is one of the worldwide epicenters of the manzanita genus, more variations of it than almost anywhere else in the world. So it had to be the anchor of this piece. And this also, we constructed a donor wall that was attached to this, that is attached to this piece that has raised over $80,000 for a local foundation. So this is a detail of it. You can see the manzanita tree. After a rain, the red of the manzanita bark really can be stop sign red. And there's also some fused glass here. You can see the purple varied bunting birds in the tree. Um, fused glass just feels amazing. I mean, you can touch anything in mosaic, it's all safe. But the fused glass, it's thick and it has texture and it just, people just love it. So here's another detail from the piece. It's all native animals um, on the piece, except I added the Pasadena parrots because I love them desperately. There are 15 species of Central and South American parrots that have come together and they live here now and some of them are endangered back home and they scream while they fly and they're wonderful and cute. So I include them in all my murals when I can. But I showed, I brought up this piece so you can see, um, I really like to activate backgrounds. Um, I don't see backgrounds as something that could be a single color. Um, I like for them to have a lot of flow and movement. So that's what's happening around my mule deer. 
Um, this is a piece for an elementary school. Um, over 200 community members came to participate in this piece. The, the panel you're seeing now is about seven feet long. And that one I did myself. These are animals of the LA River. And I'm really happy with some, I really particularly like the fish in the <laughs> kind of lower right. Um, that the LA River is this fantastic resource. It's so exciting. It's like 33 miles through the center of Los Angeles. Like everybody knows we have the beach and we have all kinds of lovely hiking in all of our hills, but we also have a river that um, is slowly being de-channelized so people can really use it. I kayak it every year and it's wonderful and exciting. And so you can also see a Pasadena parrot flying in the upper right. But so this is what the, that piece is a part of. Um, this also raised many tens of thousands of dollars for the school foundation. The community came together to help construct the piece, install the piece, and kids did drawings that we fused into glass, along with all the words, the names people, donor wall, bought their names. That was all fused. And the, so in the 66 foot long piece, there's lots of community engagement work, and there's also some done by me, um, single artist work. And it's nice to have that combination. Um, this is the last piece I'm gonna show because I'm being so fast. I hope I'm not already too long. <laughs> I was way too long when I did my practice. <laughs> Sorry about that. So this is for um, an affordable housing building in Pasadena. Um, Pasadena, California. So there was an unfortunate event, um, a tragic shooting next to this area. This is this building is in an area of Pasadena that unfortunately has um, raised levels of violence. And you could still see remnants of the shooting. You could still see where bullets had entered the building and the shooting happened years ago. And when I met with the residents and the stakeholders, they wanted, you know, people live here. This isn't um, city space. This is eight families that live in this apartment building and that it was still such a memory of that tragic day. They really wanted it to feel like their home. And they talked about weaving together their lives as they live together in community, joyful community. And what that, what grows from that is strength and community and future. And so we have three foot leaves. Um, this it's representing a kind of plant that grows in the area sometimes. But it was really lovely to work with them to come up with an idea that would kind of reconsecrate the space into it being just their home, not, not a crime scene, <laughs> um, but something they could really be proud of. And it, it worked. And that's my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hannah. That was really great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dahlia, are you ready to go? Would you like to go at this moment? I should be ready now. Thank you. Okay, great. All right. So we're gonna we're gonna switch over. We're gonna switch over to you. Um, I'm gonna share your introduction slide just really quickly with everybody so they can capture your Instagram handle or whatever they want. And then I'm now I'm turning it over to you. There okay, you great, thank you. So can you see my slide with the fiber piece? Not yet. Not yet, okay, let's see. Uh, now? Not yet. No. Strange. Okay. Um, okay, let's try this. Ah, there you are. You did okay. it. Congrats. Okay, great. So I'm um, Delia Dever, and um, this first piece here is something I did almost over 10 years ago for the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, where I did some commission work with them as a teaching artist. Um, so I chose this piece because um, it really relates to the ongoing work I've done as a contemporary fiber artist. Um, so 
and then this is kind of neat. Um, if you look at the lower right image, you'll see a glimpse of levitated mass that would, had been recently installed, which is really fun to work next to. And I had done some uh, work with some kids in East LA um, around levitated mass. Um, but this uh, fiber art piece is also a public uh, interactive piece that where we did four installations over a couple months. Um, so this uh, slide of kind of moving 10 years forward into my uh, current practices, still relating to the fiber arts and my paintings, which um, I went to California College of the Arts. It was actually arts and crafts then. So I've always been, you know, juggling all of them as many of us do. Um, but at the top, you see the um, balls of yarn there, which I was really fortunate to receive a very generous donation or um, landfill rescue actually too, it was about a small pickup truck size. And so that really gave me just an incredible palette to work uh, with. So I started doing what I call these diver art shawls. Um, I've done about 15 of them since, um, kind of creating portraits of um, people in my life through these pieces and giving them as gifts. Um, but consequently, they um, started to inform some minimalistic painting um, ideas I had been working with um, to try to come up with some something that for me uh, um, represented um, some kind of communication with the earth, if not an apology or a prayer for you know the the damages we've done, but actually in return, um, you know, call it imagination or deep listening, I ended up receiving a lot back more from this way of working that was really very positive, um, which, you know, this, this way of working in color relates to my uh, practice and training as a, a mantra um, and Dharma art practitioner. So I am um, formally trained in both vocal and um, a lot of people don't know, you know, mantras kind of become more of a common um, thing, but mantra is also something that can be um, communicated and composed through color as well. So I, I do work vocally, but um, as a visual artist, it really tapped into something that was kind of missing for me in my Western training. So um, I'm definitely been fused, fusing the Western and Eastern um, concepts and certainly pulling in wisdom um, from the specifically more Tibetan um, understanding and wisdom around the the actual uh, effects that simply that color has, which, you know, as artists, we, we don't really need to be convinced of that. But um, this was just a really fun way to work too, very nurturing during that crazy time um, and working in this kind of um, uh, horizontal, vertical, horizontal direction, which was new. And that helped with my approach to the earth mantra and really working deeply with one color at a time and mixing them by hand as oil paintings. Um, and then you circle around to the top left and that's uh, just imagine proposal for a parking garage in Fort Worth where I live, I have my studio here um, for a big project that's coming down the pike, but that's that was just um, presented as kind of an eyesore. And so I decided I was gonna do something with it, which I would really love to do more work, large scale work with these pieces um, like that. And then on the right, there's a canopy uh, concept I'm using the earth mantra. So I'm really exploring um, new ways of working with my work as public art. I've done public art um, as a teaching artist and really kind of more independent projects, but and I'm really trying to move into kind of larger scale projects along with always doing, you know, the community work. Um, so this image here shows the first um, solo exhibit uh, I was able to do once, you know, we could all come out of the woods from the pandemic. Um, so it was, it was really fun to see how the, these are uh, oil paints to see how with the natural lighting and the space, how they really did um, affect, you know, just the, the whole mood and vibe of the place. Um, and then I exhibited some of the textile pieces you can see. And then the lower right 
um, is uh, an idea of doing more of a fresco painting, which I learned we have an expert here, so I might come back and pick his brain. <laughs> um, so, and then um, here are um, my recent explorations in the last year or so um, with working with uh, more specifically the earth mantra concept still um, in form. So I've been working um, with concrete um, as a material and I'm really lucky to have a, a local um, fabricator here in Fort Worth who is uh, really skilled and um, is actually trained um, in Berkeley with one of the leading um, the 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 2D kind of one on the left um, is kind of a neat opportunity. Um, you'll see it on the plinth um, as a way to um, work kind of more as a more 2D artist. I do forms also, but um, I can create the imagery on the one side and you know keep it as a minimalistic piece on the other side. And then with the technique I'm working out with the fabricator, um, does the colored poured in place concrete, uh, well, not poured in place, but place poured in the studio. And then um, with a lot of flexibility for the kind of imagery that I can work with to you know align more fully with um, the visions of the community. And then um, there's a couple other ways that I'm just um, exploring, um, working with different materials um, still within kind of the, the earth mantra um, and my, um, you know, composing um, with color. Um, these are kind of the bottom right are imagining working with uh, sh repurposed shipping containers and even some glass with um, solar panels for illumination at night. Um, and then I, I decided to put this last slide up. Um, this is recent work. Um, it's more um, kind of independent and independently funded, the, the, especially the two on the left um, called Vote Equals Voice, where I, I collaborated um, with two other uh, significant artists, um, Cedric and Letitia Huckabee. And we, um, sparked this whole kind of effort and movement before the last major elections to put these large um, kind of billboard mural installations throughout the um, specific um, communities around our city and got people to come out and help paint them. So it turned out, I, I first I was thinking I was going to create some pieces, but um, it was really a wonderful experience to just have these artists come forward and of course you know they had the excitement and energy and talent to lead this but i'm really proud of that um, project and um, what was accomplished and continues to um, expand and then the the pieces on the right are my personal pieces um, i consider them to be uh, fiber art activist pieces um, and specifically in this series um, looking at exploring um, our individual um, food consumption really choices and their impact on the environment, on animals and plants and fish and, and insects and such. Um, I, I don't, I think the materials um, could really lend themselves well to- Excuse me, Delia, I'm sorry, you're over time. Oh, that's fine, I'm done, that's great. All, right. All done, thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Delia. That was really great. I really appreciate that. And Thank we're going to move on to our um, our last presenter for tonight, Mark Salinas. I'm going to put up his his quick slide so that you guys can get his contact info. And um, Mark, I'm going to stop sharing and turn it right on over to you. Thanks, Sue. Thank you. So I promised um, Julia and uh, Sue that there'd be a balloon drop and conf confetti-filled pinatas after mine. So <laughs> give me five minutes and we'll stay tuned to see if that happens. Do you see my screen? <laughs> yeah? Okay. Yes. Right on. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Mark Salinas. I'm a public art consultant based in Reno, Nevada, home of the Washoe, Shoshone, and Pikes people. I'm eager to share with you a passion project of mine, and you know what that means, a volunteer endeavor without pay called The First Lady Presents. 
So uh, this is a project I originally pitched to Nevada First Lady Kathy Sisolak in the summer of 2019 to use the governor's mansion as a contemporary exhibition space utilizing the historic decor and its artifacts as a, as a backdrop to view contemporary art. Well, in early 2020, the uh, COVID pandemic canceled our kickoff exhibition and the entire program indefinitely. Added to this, City Hall and our state capitol pulled the plug on its tourism-funded Department of Arts and Culture and my position as its director. So later in 2020, as an independent art consultant, I approached the First Lady in the Museum to revitalize this program. Uh, I envisioned an online initiative to reach larger audiences in a safe manner while pivoting it into something more focused, and that was to benefit underserved communities. So what you, hear, what you see here is a screenshot of the Nevada State Museum website where the First Lady program um, is posted and archived. And that should actually say January 2023, hashtag COVID cobwebs. But what is the uh, program? Let's, let's look at that. The First Lady Presents is a 1,200, 1,500 word curatorial essay of a contemporary Nevada artist portfolio juxtaposed to the an artifact from the State Museum collection. Now the State Museum uh, staff selects a monthly artifact and then I'm told what that artifact is. And then I'm self-challenged to expand that object or theme or whatever it is into content for the First Lady Presents. Sometimes my essay comparisons are easily identifiable and readily comparable. And other times those comparisons are abstract conceptual. I curate these artists throughout the state. So here we have a turn of the century uh, women's bloomers juxtaposed to an article I wrote about Reno, uh, Reno comedian David Campbell Jr. And also a native headdress juxtaposed to an article uh, about the comic books of Teddy So from the Las Vegas Paiute Indian colony. So, you know, as a Latino, I want to use utilize this platform for BIPOC, BIPOC artists, but I'm also aware of other social barriers such as ability, age, gender, and I also recognize geographic and economic barriers. So I keep track of all these curatorial rubrics on the biggest Excel sheet you can imagine to ensure that the program is um, in focus. And I share that data with the um, governor and the first lady. So here we have an Echiosaurus vertebrae juxtaposed to Carol Brown's artwork, which speaks to her own struggles with osteopetrosis. And here um, juxtaposed to the 150th anniversary of our state legislature building, yawn, is a 1970s uh, icosahedron, uh, yes, I am reading from notes, built from savage parts without electricity in Silver City, currently a population of 96. Well, that architectural structure later became an International Artist in Residency Program, which you can see at the bottom. In each essay, I introduce the reader to these artists. I elaborate on the importance of their contributions to the state. I hyperlink other accomplishments that they've made, and I share how they can learn more about the artists through the artist's website and social media. In addition to uh, online program, um, in, in addition to the online programming, I, pro I produce an MC, an annual in-mansion exhibition, which highlights the artists that we feature from each 12-month season. These artists are given a stipend from the museum to ship their works to the mansion. Some opt to drive to the mansion, which, for example, is an eight-hour drive from Las Vegas to, to Carson City. And here, the First Lady and Governor host a reception, and, and the media is always there. The first year we did this, we showcased only visual artists, but last year I included performing artists, which really made that evening, that reception, a one-time only event. And every year, um, the artists of last seasons are invited with my hope of forming a cohort as we go forward. Um, the First Lady Presents has been shared on rural Nevada news websites to regional distribution on uh, Reno PBS, even national exposure at AFTA. It's been shared in Chinese and Spanish newspapers in Nevada. Uh, the, the initiative has resulted in artist interviews, news coverage, museum acquisitions, and artist sales. It's truly become an opportunity to create uh, new history. In fact, our first in-mansion museum event, which we produced as COVID regulations were slowly being eased, was the first time the arts com community in Nevada had seen each other in person in over a year. Love was in the air. So I took a page from our own program and proposed my wife at that event. At the second in Mansion event, Teddy So from Las Vegas Paiute Indian Colony drove those eight hours to the mansion for the reception and shared on Facebook the next day the following. 
I never thought a guy from a small reservations would be invited to participate in anything like this. I had to take a few minutes afterwards, it ended, to think how far I've come in my storytelling career. I hope that my I hope that I've made not only my family proud, but my elders and the members of my tiny tribe proud, but mainly my kids. That really gets me right every time I read that. Anyhow, um, finally, we are all proud to share that Governor Sisolak's final address to the state, highlighting state accomplishments during his four-year term. The only arts program they mentioned was ours. And there you see that circle. So I invite you to follow us this year as we partner with First Lady Donna Lombardo, and you cannot spell bipartisan without the word art. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. That was great. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to um, invite you guys. If you, We've got a few minutes before we all have to part. I have a, a couple of things I want to um, uh, send you out of the room with, but we have a few minutes. Does anybody have any questions they'd like to ask of any of our any of our presenters tonight. If you do, feel free to unmute and, and just uh, speak up. Oh, everybody's being shy. Okay. Well, we're gonna we're gonna help you out by um, uh, posting this presentation after tonight so that you'll be able to look and see what their um, their uh, contact information is, and you can actually listen to the presentation again if you want to cap capture more details. It's hard to get it all on the first time. Um, so please know that that's going to be happening. Uh, I do want to say big, big thanks to everybody who was involved tonight. That was really great to have um, this presentation again. It feels it feels like we come together, even though we're all across the country right now, and we're we're out of we're out of the pandemic into the endemic, I'm not sure, but um, it feels really good to be together. And I really appreciate everybody um, participating tonight, whether you're a presenter or you are in the audience. Um, so thanks to everyone. Um, just a little uh, look ahead, um, March 15th, we're having a presentation, um, the third Shop Talk in the Save the Planet Shop Talk series. And um, the wonderful Ryan Patterson, who is on tonight is moderating it and artist Elena Toby Singer, who is also here tonight, um, will be presenting along with Javier Cortada, uh, talking about empowering community well-being through native trees and plants. Please make sure to RSVP and make, this, make that um, happen on your calendar. Um, and then we also, oops. Nope, this one. Just Sorry, this one's mine. <laughs> so um, we're also going to be doing another one of these, um, you know, exchange place kind of things, but this one is themed. This is our final um, Save the Planet Shop Talk. We are looking for presenters, same format, five slides, five minutes, um, but the, um, the themes are public art and climate change and sustainability. So if you do this kind of work, or if you know somebody that does this kind of work, um, please encourage them. This will be on PAX. You'll see the call going out soon. Um, or you can go to that, that link, which starts with bit.ly, but I'm not going to say it, um, and sign up. Um, we'll be in touch by mid-March to discuss the specifics um, and just go ahead. Excellent. And then um, just for those who joined us late, and as a reminder to everyone, please consider contributing to the work of PAX in the way that fits you best. And with that, we're going to say good night. Yes, good night. Thanks for coming, everybody. This was a good Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Julia. All right. Enjoy Thanks, it. everyone. Thank you, guys. Bye. Bye. Great job, everybody. Thank Yay. you. Thank you so much. <laughs> good night. <laughs>